oh my God, do, will you do my makeup? I want to look like that. I'm like, you want to look like a clown? Why? I mean, I mean, man, I need all of this. <laughs> this costs a lot of money to look like this, I'm sure. <laughs> costs a lot of money to look this cheap. <laughs> <laughs> For me, drag, it's, it's just, it's a costume and it's a vehicle, theatrical vehicle to portray different characters. I've been chased down the street with, by guys with bats. I've had bottles thrown at me. People will literally cross the street to spit on you. Okay, here we go. Welcome to a very special edition of The Interviewer. In this show, I am sitting down with the extremely colorful and larger than life, Sherry Vine. Sherry has joined us in Malta for part of Europride celebrations and is performing here at Gracie's in Valletta. Keith Levy, Known professionally as Sherry Vine, is an award-winning American actor, drag queen, and musician. Sherry hosted, produced, and starred in a huge number of TV shows, from Re RuPaul, Project Runway, She's Living for This, to the more recent Sherry Vine show and The Browns. Sherry is also a regular on the world's top stages with her colorful drag performance, as well as performing a host of song parodies with videos that have reached over 20 million views. Sherry tours the world with her all live singing, hilarious comedy shows, and is the star and writer of the Sherry Vine Variety Show. Wow. <laughs> Welcome. Thank Welcome, you. Sherry. Thank you so much for being here. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Well, my first question is, you're here in Malta. Have you been to Malta before? I have, but only for a few hours. I was performing on a cruise, and Malta was one of the stops, so we just had, like, one afternoon here. I was here, like, for three hours. So you're probably one of the few people uh, from other continents who actually know and can pinpoint where Malta is. Yes. A lot of people in the United States were like, where is that? And when I was telling them I was coming here, they're like, where is that? Where is that? So I had to explain. But that happens a lot. I did a show in February in Kosovo, and really no one in the United States, they were like, what? Okay, I'm going to so. ask you, Sherry, where, <laughs> for anyone that's watching, where is Kosovo? Kosovo is in the former Yugoslavia. There you go. And it's uh, next to Al um, Albania. Um, yeah, over there. You totally know your geography. I do, just from, tra I love traveling, I love geography, I love learning different cultures. Um, it How just cool. makes me so happy. So you've been here in Malta for a couple of days. Have you gotten to see much of the island? Well, I just got here last night, so I haven't seen much at all. Um, I did get a quick little tour last night of this area right here, because we're at Gracie's, and my hotel is one block away. So I just had a little tour. But tomorrow is my day off, <gasps> and I'm going to everywhere. I really want to go to, is it Medina? Medina, yeah, yeah, yeah. Medina, no, that is really special. Well, I am a, obsessed with Game of Thrones, and I heard that that's King's Landing, where they filmed King's Landing. And so as soon as I heard that, I was like, that's where I'm going. Okay, now that's cool. I've never seen K Game of Thrones ever. I know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm probably one of the few people on the planet that's never seen it. No, but it's... Gozo, you need to go to Gozo because I know that there were some scenes filmed over there as well. Oh, okay. You know, yeah, I'm a geek. If this guy has a dragon, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, thank you so much for being with us, as I said, and I'm really excited because you're actually, of everybody I've interviewed, you're actually the very first drag queen I've interviewed. Oh, I... Yeah, I know, I know, isn't that amazing? Yes. Um, so first up, I'm going to ask you, what is a drag queen? Well, I think uh, many different people would have many different interpretations or definitions of what a, a drag queen is. I believe historically it stands for dressed as girl. Okay. D-R-A-G, dressed yeah. as girl. And I didn't know that. Yes. Uh, back to the Shakespeare times where men had to play the female roles. So uh, for me, drag, it's, it's just, it's a costume and it's a vehicle, theatrical vehicle to portray different characters. Um, I'm not impersonating women. I just, 
usually. I mean, like when I play Blanche in the Golden Girls, obviously, but the volume is turned up. So it's not like I'm doing an impersonation of Rue McClanahan as Blanche. I'm doing the drag version of Blanche. So for me, drag, it's like, it's just a costume. But that's, it's a way to perform things that right. I want to do that I don't think people would pay attention the same way if I was out of drag. And it's really interesting you saying that because of course now that I, I've never ever heard anyone say what drag st stood for and referencing back to Shakespeare, yes of course, I mean women were not allowed on the stage right. and if you read any Shakespeare there are women's roles and if you go to, to you know, the, the the theatre in, in the old globe, what is it called? The Globe Theatre yes, in, in London. Right. You'll see references to, to men playing female parts. So that makes sense. So in other words, drag's been around for a very long time. Forever. And there's a big difference between drag, trans, cross-dressing. So explain so this to me. Keep breaking down one category into a hundred different yeah. categories. I mean, trans obviously is someone who identifies as a... Uh, a gender that they were not born, assigned to at birth, yep. if I'm saying that correctly, um, and can still be performing drag. Like uh, friends like Peppermint, Candace Kane, these are trans women who perform as drag queens also. Um, Cross-dresser, conventionally, I believe, is a man who maybe identifies as heterosexual who likes to wear women's clothing. It's more maybe of a fetish or it satisfies something. It's not necessarily performance related. Okay. Um, so you can you keep, I and think then, in the then, UK and Australia, they also use transvestite, which is right. not something that we really have in the United States as okay. much. Um, so someone like Dame Edna, that's a heterosexual man who a man who identifies as being heterosexual who performs in drag. It's just a character. And to me, that's still drag. Yeah. Benny Hill would dress as, a, you know, yeah, in drag yeah, yeah. to yeah, perform. Yeah. So, um, and for me, in the United States, from what I know mostly from growing up, is it's a gay man dressing, female presenting uh, to perform. It's right. performance related. So, in other words, if I was to go to the pub with you on a Friday night, you would not necessarily be dressed up as Cherry Vine. Not if I was not getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. This costs a lot of money to look like this, I'm sure. It costs a lot of money to look this cheap. <laughs> <laughs> I love the fact that you've you broken that down for us as well, because I think it's really, it's really good to distinguish the difference. Yes, and like I said, I'm not, you know, uh, an expert. I'm, there, other people might have different interpretations or definitions, but okay. that's my kind of understanding. So, and I love the little face at the back there. <laughs> so... I've described you and, and I've researched you, I've stalked you and I've looked into you a lot and there's so much to say as your introduction and I've just scratched the top of the surface. But I'm gonna ask you to describe yourself because you've, as I mentioned, you've TV, theater, stage, everything, videos. Are we serious, 20 million hits on YouTube? Yeah. That's insane. So how do you describe yourself a drag queen, but everything that you do? Well, I, I, call my, I, I consider myself an actor. And that's what I've done since I was like five years old. That's all I've ever done. There was never plan B, nothing to fall back on. I went to college. <laughs> yep, I have a master's degree in theater, in acting. And it, I just got performed in drag as this project in graduate school. Just like, why not? And something clicked, and I was like, hmm. And my acting teacher even said, oh, you should explore that. And I was like, okay. And I started a theater company with some friends of mine. One of the, uh, my friends was the writer, and he would write these plays, and I was the leading lady. And so when I first started doing drag, it was really just about doing theater and these plays. And I was waiting tables in New York and I, was, I started performing like in some of the gay clubs. And I was like, oh, I can make money doing this and not wait tables. 
So that's what it did. And I've always sang live. I didn't say it was necessarily good, but <laughs> I've always sang live. I never did lip syncing. Um, and I knew I wanted to always do comedy. Carol Burnett was my you know, spirit animal growing up, my biggest influence. And uh, I've done parodies since the day, first day I started doing drag singing. So I would describe myself as an actor who performs in drag as a way to entertain people. It's a costume like Elvira or Pee Wee. It comes after the show, it comes off. I don't sleep like this, I don't wake up like this. It's for the show. Um, and I've been doing it for 32 years and I still love it as much now as before. That's amazing, what a great career. What a, oh what gosh, a fantastic so career. To get to do what you love doing, Hallelujah. Right, there's that whole phrase, if you love what you're doing, you're never going to work for a single day. Yeah. So let's dig a little bit deeper into that career because you're in New York, you're waiting tables, your, your, your teacher, your, your theatre teacher says to you, you've got an affinity with drag, why don't you explore that? How do you get from that to this? I mean, talk me through the journey. Well, honestly, it was, it was, I was living in L.A. at the time because I went to grad school in L.A. It's the first time I lived there. And I had just started dressing up and going out for fun. And someone said, you should come and perform at my club. And I was like, no, 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 no. I'm not going to be a drag queen. I'm an actor. I'm going to do TV. I'm going to be a movie star. That was the plan. Okay. And I said, oh, well, maybe I'll try this. And so I started, I performed at this club and I sang live. And I certainly did not invent that. In the United States in the 40s and the 50s and 60s, drag queens sang live. No one lip sang. That didn't come around until maybe in the 60s, 70s. And, but in LA, there were not very many drag queens at all that sang live. So someone's like, oh my God, you have to come and do that here. And you have to do that here. And I was like, okay. A friend of mine in New York was visiting, the person I told you who was a, a playwright. She's like, I'm going to write this play. You have to come to New York. You're going to play the mother, the leading lady. I was like, um, okay, I'll go to New York for a month. It was massive. I mean, it was just it, it, this massive hit. And it was kind of following in the footsteps of Charles Ludlam, Charles Bush, and so again, did not invent it at all, would never claim that, but it was following these footsteps of male actors who played the leading ladies. Can't be theatrical. And we started this theater company. I said, oh, I guess I'm moving to New York and I guess this is what I'm gonna do. And again, it was one of those things where I was like fighting it because in my head I was like, no, 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 no. I'm gonna be a movie star, I'm gonna do Broadway. I was getting up at six o'clock in the morning to go stand in line all day to audition for some play out of drag. And my roommate was like, why are you not embracing this? You're doing something that people are responding to and they want to see more of and you're fighting it. And I said, okay, you know what? Maybe I'll just give that a try. And once I let go of that and embraced it and said, this is what I'm gonna do, it just, took off and it was so organic and natural. Like I didn't, I paid my dues for sure, but it wasn't like, I wouldn't call it a struggle. I mean, I just was in this right place doing the right thing at the right time. But then, before we come to the rest of the career with the, song, the singing and the YouTube views and all this, but then coming back to that, has there ever been a, a point where you said to yourself, you know what, I'm cast type, I'm stereocast as, as being a drag queen, I really want to still explore being a, a, an actor in the movies, or, or you just fell in love and said, that's it. Because you've been doing this 30 years, I mean, that's yeah, a I long mean, time to be, to be in the same kind of role, yeah, I, I mean, guess. I get to play different roles because, like, when we had the theatre company, I wasn't Sherry Vine. Right. I was Sherry Vine as Hedda Gabler, or Sherry Vine as whatever the character was. Yeah. So it was kind of like Keith Levy as Sherry Vine as <laughs> Nora from Doll's House. Like we did this completely twisted, hilarious version of a Doll's House and I was Nora. So I got to, I was fulfilled as an actor, got to do that. Now, obviously when I do my cabaret show, that's Sherry Vine. 
But it's just, it's always fun because I always, it's always, I have to win this audience over every single time. You can't take it for granted, you know, it's always gonna be different. It's gonna be different people. One night you might be completely on where they laugh at everything you say. And the next night it's like, oh, this isn't working. So it's always different. And after 30 years, like I said, it's still like tonight, the show I have to do tonight, it's going to be, I don't know who's gonna be there. Do they know who I am? Are they seeing me for the first time? Are they seeing a drag queen for the first time? So there's all these factors that come into play. So every single night is different, and it should be. I think once you kind of aren't nervous at all in any way, then that's a slippery slope. I hadn't even thought of that. You have to win over or win over or entertain uh -huh. a new audience every time you go out. Yeah, and and think, I'm and guessing it, there must be some uncertainty there as well, well because you don't know why they've come. Absolutely, yeah. Wow. You don't know who it's going to be. All right, is it going to be gay men? Is it going to be all straight people? Are they, do they understand all the English pop culture references that are in my songs? There's, you know, all these different factors. Wow. It's more complicated than just getting up on stage and just doing the same old routine. Absolutely. I mean, I think if you're in a long running play on Broadway where you're doing eight shows a week, every show is going to be different. Right. Every audience is different. Wow. And you need to be, you have to give every single show as if it's your first and it's the most important show of your life. Holy every cow. single time. That I think hard. so. That is hard work, right? I mean, I, I, it's something I've never thought about. I've never, and probably most of the people watching this have never thought about it either because it's not something you think, oh, actually, you know, every time you've got to put out the best performance. You kind of think, well, maybe if you're doing something over and over again, you get a little bit comfortable. And, and wow. That's what I mean. I, in my opinion, I, once, if you feel like that comfortable, then that's a slippery slope. That's what I think. You should never feel that comfortable. So let's, let me come to this question. What has been the highlight of your 30 year long career? What is that? You know, somebody described this to me before. They said some memories are hard, hardwired. Some memories are going to live with you forever. Do you have those memories that, I mean, you must do, that, you, that are those? So many. <laughs> ah! <laughs> okay, give me a couple. There's so many. I mean, I feel so lucky to have, be like, oh, I've had so many of my dreams come true. And not a lot of people get to say that. So I don't take that for granted at all. Um, I wake up every morning saying, thank you, universe. And I go to bed every night saying, thank you, universe. Um, I have my own TV show. It's a variety show. Total, total Carol Burnett variety show, 1970s, the Sherry Vine variety show. I had one like 12 years ago called She's Living For This. Um, that's a dream come true. Because growing up as a little kid, I would watch the Carol Burnett show. I'd watch Donnie and Marie, the Cher, Sonny and Cher, and be like, that's what I want to do. Because you get to sing, you get to act, you get to play different characters, you can be funny, you can give a moment of drama. Everything, everything in 20 minutes. And to get to do that, to get paid to do that, is literally a dream come true. I've performed on stage with Madonna. I mean, so many different people so that I'm what? obsessed with and love. And okay, go back, go go back. Madonna, and that did not come up on the the. Oh no! No, oh, you can see that on YouTube. You can you. see it on YouTube. Wow, when was that? I think it was 2000. It was 1999 or 2000. It was the VMAs when they were celebrating her. Gosh. I want to say 20 years, but that wouldn't make sense. Because um, I think she started in the early 80s. So I don't know. Anyway, it was a tribute to Madonna. And they had like 10 different drag queens each come out and do like 30 seconds of one of her songs. And I was like a virgin. And it came out with the wedding dress from, the, um, from one of her first appearances on MTV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then she came down and she met everybody and said hello and everything. And I've run into her a couple of times and... Nice. Yeah, she's sort of like, hi. I don't know if she knows my name, but she's like, hi. She loves drag, and so whatever. She was super cool. But that was the highlight. Um, I was actually performing, working in Barcelona for the summer, 
And they asked if I wanted to do that. I said, yes. And I'm like, well, we're not going to fly you in from Barcelona. I was like, oh, we will be, I will be there. Don't worry. <laughs> um, I've done movies and theater. Um, one of our shows from our little theater company that was very off, 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 off Broadway got picked up and moved to off Broadway. That was the dream come true. So, yeah. That's amazing. Well, I mean, do you think that if you had taken a different route, and I, I know it's a speculative kind of question, but if you'd taken a different route and not kind of adopted this sherry vine and the drag and, and the, 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 the cabaret and all this sort of thing, do you think you would have had so much success? Well, I mean, I have no way of knowing, of course. Yeah, I mean, like I course. said, I really grew up, my goal was to be a movie star. <laughs> And so it was definitely jumping tracks. I mean, true story, when I told my parents that I was going to move to New York to do drag, they weren't shocked that I was going to do drag. They were like, what do you mean you're leaving Los Angeles your whole life? That's all you've talked about is being in LA and now you're there, so you're gonna move to New York. So that's what they were more shocked about. <laughs> but. Um, uh, this acting teacher, who, her name is Anna Devere Smith, and she's a very well-known actress and TV personality in the United States. When she's the one who said, you need to explore that, she said to, gave me a piece of advice that I really heard. And she said, you're going to have a very hard time in Hollywood because you don't fit any type. You're not a leading man. You're not weird enough. You don't look like, a, like the nerd the drug addict, like you don't fit. This was 19, 1988. <laughs> she was like, you don't fit any category. So now while it's, I think it's expanded and certainly in TV and film, back then it really was like, you're not Tom Cruise, you're not Steve Buscemi, where do you fit in? And she said, you need to create your own path because otherwise you're gonna have a hard time. Good for you. Right, so when this, it just, organically fell into my lap that my best friend from Maryland, where I grew up, said, I'm gonna write this play. And another friend was like, I'm gonna write it, uh, direct it. And we had friends that was a costume designer and a friend who has now won like six Tonys was gonna do, I'm gonna do the sets and lights. So like this theater company just, literally the universe gave us this company. And I was like, how can I say no to that? And that's why I'm here. Now, I don't know what would have happened if I stayed in Hollywood and pursued doing TV and film, or not, who knows? But you're obviously happy with the path and the way that it's turned out because you have these incredible experiences. I have my own TV show, I've done movies, I get people fly me all over the world. Who can complain? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, and cheers to that. Cheers. But that. listen, you just mentioned then 1988, and I'm gonna go back because uh, the last show that we did here at Gracie's, we talked about the very origins of Pride. And the origins of Pride uh, only go back to, to 10 years before that, obviously to the Stonewall and, and the Stonewall riots and everything that was happening there. And then of course, Gay Pride went out across the US and then eventually it, it managed to come across uh, the waters to the rest of the world. Back then, when you started doing what you're doing, was there pushback? Was there? Oh my gosh! Yes, yeah, it's tell, horrible. Tell me about I mean, that. I started technically started Sherry Vine in like 1991, so it's been 32 years. Right. And yeah, you literally took your life into your hands every time you walked out the door in New York City, and this is New York City where it was certainly there are gay people, hundreds of drag queens, but. I've been chased down the street with, by guys with bats. I've had bottles thrown at me. People will literally cross the street to spit on you. You know, it was just a, a lot of that. Not a lot, but there were, those things did really happen. And so I feel like I have a very, from living in New York City in the early 90s, I have a very kind of tough shield. And I have 20 eyes around my head. You know, I mean, just walking from my hotel to here, in broad daylight in drag. I've never done that in Malta. I've certainly never been in drag. And I texted Danny, who works here at Gracie's, like, is it safe? And he's like, you'll be fine. And I was like, okay. And I just did it. And it was fine. <clears throat> but trust me, I've got like eyes going. Burp, burp, burp. Um, 
That being said, I clearly remember where I lived when I first moved to New York City in the East Village. It was called the Al Alphabet City, and it was no man's land. And it was like, you could not get a taxi. It was very sketchy. And I had to walk like three blocks to get to the Pyramid Club, which is a very famous bar in the East Village to perform. And every night I was like, okay, here we go. And just march like you own the street. And it was sketchy. And I clearly remember the same people that were yelling like, faggot, and all this kind of stuff. When RuPaul came out with Supermodel, all of a sudden I would be walking the same street, the same people would be like, you better work, you better work. I was like, oh, okay. So RuPaul actually saved my life in a way. Like she really changed, she made drag more mainstream. And now certainly RuPaul's Drag Race has made it very mainstream. And when I started performing as drag, it was not considered a legitimate art form, which is very different than the UK. You've always had drag and it's always been considered an art form, Berlin, Sydney. But in the United States, it was not, it was fringe. And the, we're performing for gay men in a gay bar, you know, and maybe they're straight female friends. Then all of a sudden the crowds changed. You have s straight cisgender women coming to the shows. You have straight men. It's very, very, very different now. Um, and it's considered a legitimate art form. It has been monetized and commercialized. But coming back to that, so you've gone from an era where you felt obviously felt very threatened and, and I can only imagine, well, I suppose as a woman, I can imagine walking sure. down the street and constantly being very careful. And uh, you probably more so because you're a little bit brighter than most, <laughs> most of us. <laughs> you know, in your drag there, you are absolutely the most colorful person on the street. <laughs> but as a woman, I can, uh, I can at least relate to that because mm -hmm. as a woman, we often, I think we, that's overlooked, that we often walk down the street we're, we're clocking all the time. Who oh my is God, that behind of us? Course. What's that going on there? Do I need to be careful? And even in Europe and in Malta, you still want to be a little bit careful. It doesn't matter where you are. You just want Absolutely. to make sure that you're aware of what's going on. Yeah. Now, I'm guessing that out of drag, things are much easier. I wouldn't say much easier because, oh, really? I mean, I look very gay. I mean, you know, I've got these thin little eyebrows. There's no one's going to look at me and not know that I'm not gay. So uh, that can be dangerous. Like when I was asked to perform in Kosovo. Right. I was immediately like, yes, I love going places I've never been before. And I said, yes. And then it sunk in. I was like, what do I really know about Kosovo? I was like, I better investigate. And I did, I went online. I was like, is it safe to go there with an Israeli last name? Is it safe to go there as a you know, gay person? Um, all of this, and it turned out, yes, it's actually the same level as Germany or France. So I was like, okay. And, but the concept of gay, drag, trans and all is quite new there. Mm -hmm. There's one gay bar, it's only a year old. It's the first one run by a trans man who's like a very famous there because he's the first openly trans person and it just turned out to be so lovely. And they told me, I was like, you know, are you guys worried? They're like, well, you have to be cautious, but this is in the city of Pristina. Once you, maybe if you go into the countryside, it might be different. But in the city, they're like, people mind their own business. So they might not understand it or care for it or whatever, but they don't say anything or do anything. They mind their own business. I was mm -hmm. like, great, okay. Fair enough. And I didn't walk around alone in drag there, but I wasn't scared to walk around during the day out of drag. And I would be in parts of the United States. Oh, really? Oh, 100%. Okay, which parts of the US? Anything outside of a big city. <laughs> which kind of brings me to my next- Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, whatever. Absolutely. 
Which brings me to my, my next question, because we talked about starting off where it's a, you know, you felt threatened, moving through, safer, you know, you're feeling more comfortable. But at the moment, drag is getting some very bad press. So have things deteriorated? I, I was going to ask you, do you ever feel unsafe? But obviously you do. Oh my gosh, of course, especially right now. I mean, you kind of thought that things in the United States were moving in the right direction with the Obamas. I miss them so much. And then along comes Trump, and it just, he kind of legitimized homophobia, racism, xenophobia, all of it. He gave voice to those people. But you're saying, going back to exactly what you said from the very beginning, you are a man dressed up as a part, playing a character as a woman, which in essence is nothing new. We've seen this for hundreds and hundreds of years, albeit maybe it was in a different context, but it, it's still the same thing. And you're embracing this character. So I find it's still difficult to understand why, why people be so threatened by that. Because well, I mean, I, I can tell you exactly why, Go and on. it's actually, this is my opinion, but it's 100% not to do with drag. It's all a spin. It's all, someone has to be blamed for the things in my life that aren't going right. It's the Jews, it's the blacks, it's the Mexicans, and right now it's the drag queens. And it's just a spin. They don't want people talking about guns. They want the blame, okay, oh, it's the drag queens. Drag queens are trying to recruit our children by reading books to them. And it's like, Wanda Sykes said it perfectly, and she's just like, okay, when a drag queen, when children, when a drag queen comes to the school to read To Kill a Mockingbird or some book to children, probably not that book, but some book, <laughs> Dr. Seuss to children, and children start getting killed, then we have a conversation. It has nothing to do with drag. They don't want people talking about guns, which is what is killing the children in schools, period. Because Mrs. Mrs. Doubtfire, for instance, when are we, you know, thinking about a, a, a male actor playing a female in a film that's totally was totally utterly acceptable, Mrs. Doubtfire. Now, albeit that's not a drag show, but it's still the premise of a woman of a man playing a woman. Yeah, I mean, I love those shows, and I love that movie. I have my uh, my, um, and it's not an issue at all because that's going to sound like I don't like that or approve of the movie. I love it. I'm just saying. There's a difference between, in those, Mrs. Doubtfire and some movies like that, some like it hot, it's heterosexual men who have to dress up in order to escape or to get something. You know what I mean? It's yeah. not drag to me. Yep. Robin Williams is kind of in drag, but it's not like, it's not what I do. <laughs> No, but the concept of a man wearing female clothing is nothing. It's not threatening, not but it's not threatening to those ah. people because he's not gay. And it's like, oh, he has to do this. He doesn't have a choice. Right. Gotcha. Thank you for the clarification there. That makes <laughs> sense. Okay, but listen, your drag show, obviously, your cabaret, your, your um, variety show, people choose to go. People choose to pay. People choose to watch you. People choose. They electively choose to be entertained by you. Right. Now, I am under the impression that some of it is a little bit, um, how can we put this? Blue. Oh, thank you. Yes, let's go with that one. So tell me about that. Tell me about your act, because I think it's really important to say that Again, I'm going to reiterate, you are playing a role. You're dressed up as Sherry Vine. You're playing a part, and people are electively choosing to come and see you. So tell me about your act that you're going to be doing here in Malta or if you're going to go in to Kosovo or if you're going to go to anywhere else. What are we usually going to see? Well, my act is definitely adult, 100%. I'm not interested in performing for kids. My show is 18 and over, period. Once in a while, I'll have someone message me or email me or, or like, 
someone from working at the theater come up like, someone's here with their 16-year-old daughter and they really want to come. I'm like, if they're clear and signing off that this is an adult show, it's sexual humor, then great. Now, that being said, it's completely stupid. It's stupid and it's silly. I'm not being vulgar for this trying to offend anyone. My goal is to make people laugh. My goal for me, especially in light of what's going on in the United States and everything now, is to take you away for 30 minutes or 45 minutes. We watch the news all day. It's an earthquake, it's a flood, it's Trump, it's something all day. And my job is for 30 minutes is to make you laugh. And that's not to say to make you forget what's going on in the world because at the end of the show, we go back to living in the real world. But for my show, for that amount of time, it's to take you away and make you laugh. I am dirty and some people are like, you don't have to be dirty, you can really sing. And it's like, that's what I do, that's what I think is funny. There are other people who sing that aren't dirty. And there's people who lip sync, you go see someone lip sync to Whitney Houston, which is gorgeous and entertaining and you're gonna love it. This is what I do and it's not for everybody. That's what I do. But that's why I say you uh, you choose to come and see Sherry Vine. You and, and well, Sherry like tonight, Vine, yeah, yes. makes it clear that's what you're gonna get. Well, a lot of people don't know that. Okay. A lot of people think, oh, it's a drag show, and they don't ha know who I am. They don't know that it's adult. Uh, I think I've become quite adept at s slowly bringing people like, okay, just get your toe wet. Now you could come into your ankles. Now dive in. You know, um, I don't just start right off like, here's a song about fellatio. We, we build up to that. <laughs> and I'm good at feeling them out. And I just feel like a good example. Uh, during the pandemic, I was hired to do a Zoom show. I should have did a lot of Zoom shows for a mostly LGBT group of business graduate students. And there were a thousand, like a thousand of them across the country watching. And the person organizing was like, just please don't be dirty because we don't really know who's watching and if people are gonna be offended. I'm like, okay. And I started and like halfway through the show, he's texting me repeatedly. People are like asking, how come you're not being dirty? <gasps> and I was like, oh, got it change that playlist and give them what they want. So that's another, uh, sometimes I just have to remind myself, this is what you do, stick to what you do, and they're, they're gonna love it, and sometimes they won't. I've had, I perform this song, it's probably my most popular parody of Hallelujah, which is this sacred, revered song around the world. My version is called How I Blew Ya. <laughs> and it's the most popular one of ever pop song I ever have done. And out of a hundred people, there'll be one who's just so completely offended. And it's like, okay, well then I'm doing it for the 99. So people need to know this before they come to see you, but if, they, if they're happy with that, they're gonna have a great, great show. Now yeah. you just mentioned this Zoom call. So I'm gonna ask you, Sherry, this is my penultimate question. <laughs> I'm gonna ask you if, You've obviously had this incredible career. We talked about the TV, we talked about the, I'm gonna come back, two million YouTube views. <laughs> if you could have that one thing that you haven't yet done, if you could perform in front of that one person or in that one country or that one circumstance, if someone to say, you know what, Sherry, you've had this amazing, amazing career, but I'm just gonna give you all of your Christmas presents that you've ever wanted in one experience, what would it be? I would love to do more movies. <laughs> I would love to do more theater out of drag. Not that I would ever stop performing a Sherry Vine, but I just kind of had been so long, I would love to do that. And my dream, if you said pick one, yeah. here's a blank check, I want to do Three Sisters, Anton Chekhov on stage. And I, you know, with Which a theater? male Which cast. Which theater? You can have any theater in the world, my love. Some gorgeous off-Broadway theater in New York City. Nice. Uh, yes. Yeah. That would be a dream, because I've always, ever since I started performing in drag, I was like, 
one day we need to do The Three Sisters. It's one of my favorite plays and still haven't done it. So that's on my list. That's on your list. So I said that was my penultimate question, my last question for you, and I'm absolutely dying to ask this. I've been, asked, I've been thinking about this ever since I sat down with you. How long does it take for you to do your makeup? Because my goodness, it's really good. What makeup? <laughs> okay. uh, um, 90, this is 90 minutes from start to finish. Holy cow. I can do it a lot faster if I have to, but I really like to kind of just put on some music and relax and take my time, and then it's 90 minutes. I love what you said before we sat down. You said, I'm not trying to look like a woman. No. You're trying to look like Sherry Vine, and this is the part that you play. Yeah, I mean, I have like cisgender women all the time. They're like, oh my God, do, will you do my makeup? I want to look like that. I'm like, you want to look like a clown? Why? I mean, <laughs> I'm a man. I need all of this, and <laughs> everything needs to be bigger. The lips are bigger, the lashes are bigger. My mom's always like, why do you paint your lips so big? And I'm like, because it's for the stage. <laughs> but you've got this highlighter on here and everything. I mean, seriously, you got that whole makeup thing right down to an arc, because I'm telling well, you, I have it's been 30 years. There. I could show you pictures so you can find them online. <laughs> where it's not like this at all. Um, this has kind of been evolved. Uh, when I first started doing drag, I thought I had to look funny to be funny. And so the makeup was a mess. And, and there are drag queens who do that. Now you see drag queens with beards, you know? Yeah. And that's great. I, there should never be one type of drag. It would be boring, and then it would be like, I don't want to compete with a thousand people. This is how I've evolved, because I wanted my act to be like a Las Vegas sex kitten. And so the look needed to evolve. And I remember people in New York, when I first started to change the look, they're like, Cherry, don't, don't, don't do it. You're just, don't change your look. You don't have to. And I'm like, it's, I know I don't have to. I want to. I want to walk out and have people be like, oh, okay. And then I start singing and they're like, oh, ha, ha, ha. You know, that's, that's what, that's the goal. Well, listen, Cherry Vine, Las Vegas, Sex Kitten, you look beautiful. <laughs> and I you. have to say, thank you very, very much for being with us in Malta at Gracie's and here on the interviewer. Thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure. I love that. Las Vegas sex kitten. Yeah.